97 percent of scientists, including, by the way, some who originally disputed the data, have now put that to rest. They've acknowledged the planet is warming and human activity is contributing to it. So the question now is whether we will have the courage to act before it's too late. And how we answer will have a profound impact on the world that we leave behind, not just to you, but to your children and to your grandchildren. As a president, as a father, and as an American, I'm here to say we need to act. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that was a, a bold-faced lie from Barack Obama speaking today, I think, at Georgetown University. I wonder if he had the crosses covered up again. Um, and uh, he was talking about uh, global warming. Every issue that America couldn't care less about, he's addressing. Uh, the, the one issue America cares about, jobs and the economy, gets no, no traction whatsoever. He also went on to say... Uh, by the way, the lie was 97, because he said 90. 97 percent of scientists agree that the Earth is warming, and, and, and some of them were doubters in the front, and now they all agree. So the, so the argument's over. Joining us now to talk about all this is our friend Mark Morano. He is the um, founder and executive director of ClimateDepot.com. Hey, Mark. Hey, Steve. Thanks for having me on. i, I got to tell you, and he also said he's directing the EPA to put an end to what he called limitless dumping of carbon pollution from power plants and complete New pollution standards for both new and existing power plants, which means electricity rates are going to go through the roof. Uh, we have a, a, a member of his um, administration, Daniel Schrag, a White House climate advisor and director of the Harvard University Center for the Environment, telling the New York Times that we need a war on coal. And he says, we'll do the Keystone Pipeline, Obama says, if we could prove that it's not going to increase carbon emissions or greenhouse gases. So this was a one, two, three punch. He's doing it without Congress. And um, I don't know if anybody's taking notice. Yeah, here's the problem. When you do a full frontal assault on global warming, whether it's a U.N. treaty or whether it's cap and trade or a carbon tax, the American public rejects it wholesale. They shut down Congress. They have phone calls or 10 to 1 against it. They, congressmen and senators go home to their home districts at town halls. They get booed and jeered. So President Obama has a learning curve. He's doing something very smart strategically. He's decided not to take this on head on. He's going to do it quietly in the bureaucracy by shutting down coal plants, by going after natural gas fracking, by raising the cost of electricity, by bankrupting our energy sector, by by doing all this and mandating energy that hasn't proven itself to, to have any significant impact, solar and wind. But he's going to do it all through an, a faceless bureaucracy behind the scenes through arcane policy wonkish regulations. And this is the way to get things done in Washington because it's not going to be big and brassy where Congress has to have an up or down vote. This is going to be quietly behind the scenes and he can have a real impact on our regulations and that's what he's aiming for and by golly the supreme court empowered the epa to do this back in 2007 and the in this horrible ruling that said the epa could evaluate co2 as a pollutant and that's the other thing carbon dioxide is not a pollutant un ipcc the climate scientist with the united nations dr richard toll came out and attacked Obama for calling CO2 pollution. Carbon dioxide is not a pollutant, not now, not here, not to us. And he goes on and says the human, uh, a lack of, of uh, CO2 is dangerous. CO2 concentrations in the human lung are 37,000 parts per million, and we're only talking 400, uh, 400 parts per million in the atmosphere. And this is where the whole key is. He keeps talking about carbon pollution. The bottom line is the Earth has been cooling since 2002. We've been at a temperature plateau, if you go longer, since about 15 to 17 years. This is a mockery. And the ultimate mockery is he's acting as though whatever he's talking about, energy efficiency, mandates, destroying coal, is going to have some impact on storms, floods. And so, and well, let me, let me, give, you, let me give you a story from the New York Times um, t yesterday by Justin Gillis. Uh, and the title of it is, Air Pollution May Have Suppressed Storms, Research Suggests. The ever-growing list of ways humanity seems to have altered the Earth 
uh, has another candidate. Air pollution may have had a major soothing influence on storm cycles in the North Atlantic. It's a paper published this week suggesting that industrial pollution from North America and Europe through much of the 20th century may have altered clouds in ways that cooled the ocean surface. That, in turn, may have suppressed storms and particularly major hurricanes below the level that would have existed in a purely natural environment. So there's another one. But when he said 97% of scientists, even those who used to disagree, they're all on board. That's it. The, the debate is over. This is, a, this is a horrific tactic that he uses over and over yeah, again. There's 97% has been around. There's like multiple global warming activists making these claims. What they do, the latest claim, uh, it, was, it was published, and they basically they exclude all these studies that don't take a position on global warming, which is like two-thirds, and they get all these studies, which are typically modeling studies. In other words, all these, if you study butterflies and you do a global warming study on the possible impact of the temperature on butterflies in the southwest United States 100 years from now, suddenly you're a global warming scientist, part of the consensus, despite the fact that you never once looked at how CO2 impacts temperature. And that's what they've done. They get this huge gravy train of money. All these scientists start looking at impact studies, modeling studies, and having you know, just a whole cottage industry. And then they survey all these scientists and they say, hey, look, all these scientists believe in global warming, when the vast majority never even studied whether CO2 impacts temperature. You know, this is where the absurdity comes from. It's they put a, in the 1970s, they had a consensus that the world was going to be overpopulated. We were all going to have resource scarcity. Now the idea of overpopulation is a joke, as the, the many developed world isn't even having enough kids to replace their current population. We're going to hit a peak and then start declining. But all the scientists believed in the 70s we were facing scarcity, famine, overpopulation. It didn't pan out. They moved on to the next eco-scare. That's what's going to happen. So, so, Mark, we got 30 seconds, and, and so, so this is going to result uh, in higher electricity prices, which he promised when he was running in 08. Skyrocketing is what he said. Uh, coal is going to be destroyed, and there's nothing we could do about it. No. In fact, his own advisor admitted, yeah, that coal should be destroyed, essentially. And Obama has called it. His, his, his current science advisor, John Holdren, said one of the hazards of a free society is, is abundant, cheap energy. He said that in 1975. Yep, I know. This is all part of their agenda, and they're achieving it, and they're going to do it quietly now behind the scenes. I know. Mark, Mark, I, I, check out.